So we've spent another day looking at assumptions and theorems and derivations. What does it take to get uh, from a discount factor model, from the consumption-based model, to the CAPM, the ICAPM, multi-factor models, and so on and so forth? As before, knowing these assumptions and derivations, I think, helps you to th be much clearer about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what kind of model is important for what kind of application. All of these models, now that you've seen how they're derived, they replace consumption growth with the determinants of consumption growth in one way or another. And that's an important uh, realization. Qu quite often you'll find people say, oh, that consumption model, it's terrible. Everybody knows people are irrational. We'll just use the CAPM. Well, I'm sorry, the consumption model is the CAPM. The CAPM is the consumption model. The capital asset pricing model is a special case of the consumption model, where we assumed, in addition to what you may feel is, uh, is, the, um, is too much rationality, we also assumed that people didn't have a job, which is even, even less realistic. They are all special cases. They are not alternatives to the basic idea of the consumption-based model. And in fact, the consumption-based model is the most general uh, it is the one that subsumes all the other ones. Every single one of these other models also has in it as a prediction that consumption growth should be the single pricing factor. We just, for some reason, we don't want to use consumption growth. We don't want to uh, think about its measurement problems and so forth. But it's in there in every single one of these derivations. That's a useful thing to keep in mind as, as something you've learned by watching the derivations. You've seen that the assumptions are, in fact, very special and not at all realistic. And that's the way of all economics. Economics, we make quantitative parables. We don't make deeply realistic models, and, and, and we, we make the models as complicated as necessary to work in practice. Uh, that's the way it is. I wish that the assumptions were more realistic, uh, but they're not. Um, when we look at these models in practice as well, you'll be profoundly unsettled that the derivations and the assumptions uh, they're used for inspiration, but nobody takes them seriously in a scientific testing or checking matter. I mean, they may write in their introductions, we're going to test the capital asset pricing model, but then they throw out three quarters of the implications that are testable in the data we have. An example, the capital asset pricing model included in its predictions is that the factor risk premium is risk aversion coefficient times the volatility of consumption growth. We just agreed not to look at consumption data but this consumption data scream that this is, this is a horrible prediction because consumption growth volatility is only about 1 or 2%. So that needs a risk aversion of 50 or so to make it work. Another assumption in the CAPM derivation is that consumption growth equals the rate of return on the wealth portfolio. They move one for one. That means consumption growth has a 16% standard deviation. That's a prediction of the model. Well, we're not that interested in that prediction of the model. That's OK. That's the way things work. You should just understand that, that these, the way finance works is not in this kind of pure scientific testing of every aspect of a theory, for better or for worse. That's how these models are, are, are used. Similarly, the ICAPM, the ICAPM, we said that the x, the, the things that we're going to use as factors, should be things that forecast uh, future investment opportunities. And that the risk premium isn't a free parameter, as the risk premium in the CAPM isn't a free parameter. The risk premium isn't a free parameter there. The risk premium should come from understood derivatives of the value function. Well, when using the ICAPM, it's, it's very seldom that people even bother checking that their factors do, in fact, forecast investment opportunities. And, and, and almost unheard of for people to actually solve and check whether the derivatives of the value function generate the risk premiums or just take the risk premiums as free parameters. Uh, in, in the use of macroeconomic models and mimicking portfolios, uh, with very, very few exceptions, at, at best it's, well, I've got some factors. Gee, these factors might be mimicking portfolios for some macro models. Let's go on. But, but it's, it's, it's very seldom that anyone takes the actual macroeconomics, works a macro model to figure out what those things are, actually finds the mimicking portfolios, and then tests those. I, I can't think of an example where that's true. I don't mean to be critical. This is how finance works. And, and our job is to study how finance works. Having studied these implications, uh, you might expect a more scientific approach. That's just not the world that we're faced with and, and how things are done. Um, 
But you should still be very unsettled by that, as I'm unsettled by that. Uh, the point of why we got here was we, we found a perfect portfolio, the ex post mean variance efficient portfolio. And I gave my last lecture and sermon about how important it was to discover some rules of the game that kept you from fishing around and finding ex post mean variance efficient portfolios. Well, well, if the rules of the game aren't to write down models and test them, what are the rules of the game? The rules of the game are a little bit more of an art. And, and we'll have to read some papers and think about how the rules of the game are being used. And you'll have to think about what the right rules of the game are. One of our next tasks will be to look back at the Fama and French paper and think hard about what rules of the game are they employing to keep themselves from finding an ex post mean variance efficient portfolio and to convince you that they've done something, that they've run through adequate hoops, that in fact their model is an explanation, at least for the phenomenon that they want to do. But also, how many assumptions do you really use? Part of the reason for what you may regard as this unscientific loosey-goosiness is that in most applications, we don't use all the deep assumptions of the model. We don't really need them. Let me give you an example to make that a little more concrete. A most common thing that you do with an asset pricing model is you evaluate an anomaly. So suppose uh, uh, you have some strategy that seems to offer a, an expected return, maybe an anomaly. Somebody told you some new great way to pick stocks. Or maybe you're evaluating a fund. Maybe someone is trying to sell you, come invest with me and look at the great average returns that you get. What do you do with that? Well, you, you, you check whether that expected return is, in fact, justified by, let's just try the CAPM. And suppose you find it. The expected return, you find, hey, wait a minute, this anomaly, this fund, it, it's giving the expected returns it's giving are exactly what the CAPM says it ought to be giving. Or equivalently, you run a regression of that return on the market. You find that there's the beta, no intercept. The CAPM explains this anomaly. That's a standard thing to do and a very useful thing to do, especially if you want to save yourself a whole bunch of fees from a hedge fund. But so what have we accomplished there? And how many of the assumptions did we really use? What, have, what can we say from that? Well, we can say, hey, wait a minute. I can get this anomaly return just by investing in the index. I can get that hedge funds return just by investing in the index. This anomaly is not a new anomaly. It's if maybe the market's an anomaly, but it's, it's a different version of an old anomaly. This hedge fund isn't doing anything new. It's just investing in the index. Uh, you've learned something else. You can learn, if I want to invest in this anyway, I can hedge that risk by shorting the index. Beta gives you a good hedge ratio. You've at least learned that this new anomaly is as rational or as irrational as the market. What have you not done? Well, you don't know whether the market premium is rational or not. There's a sense in which you haven't found a deep explanation of everything there is to know about the rationality of asset pricing. Um, but you've certainly learned a whole bunch of things. Why? Because you didn't really use any of the assumptions behind the CAPM in, in using the CAPM in that fashion. And that's quite common in practice, which is why very often in practice, though people will write, I'm testing an asset pricing model, what they're really doing is using an asset pricing model to one of these ends that doesn't require so many assumptions. Furthermore, for what we've used, even if I know the capital asset pricing model is wrong, I know the CAPM is wrong. It doesn't price value portfolios. Yet all of this exercise and all of these implications are perfectly valid, even though I know the assumptions of the capital asset pricing model are wrong, and even though I know the capital asset pricing model will not price value portfolios. Well, if it prices this thing, I've learned something very important about this opportunity. So that's a sense in which, in which we use models that it's a justification for using models, even though we're doing a terrible job of testing. Uh, you still can't use that observation to win a fight with a behavioralist. Well, you're asking different questions.